Um, again, my name is Daniel Moyer, Simplify Power, Briggs & Stratton. Really quickly, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because if anybody's taken some of our trainings before, you've already heard this, and it's, but it's important to run through some of our company history and overview. We were originally founded in 2010 as OES Energy, and OES Energy had developed these lithium-ion battery packs for the film and broadcast industry. And we were unique at the time because we were one of the first companies to hit the market with an LFP chemistry or a lithium iron phosphate chemistry, as opposed to some of the cobalt based chemistries that have been on the market. So 2010 is actually kind of ancient history when it comes to these battery packs. And so we've had this time and this experience over the past 12 years uh, to develop our battery packs to develop our intellectual property that we put into our cell packs, into our battery management systems. So we've always done LFP chemistry since our beginning. Uh, and so we've really built on that experience. We partnered with the military in the 2011, 2012. At that time, the military was operating uh, on these forward operating bases, uh, diesel generators and uh, lead acid batteries that were dead on arrival. So we were able to approach the uh, DOD with a lithium ion battery. Initially, they didn't like the idea of any lithium ion batteries because at that time, cobalt had such a dangerous kind of reputation. We explained to them that we have a safer chemistry, LFP. They ultimately wanted to test it. They took our batteries out to the Aberdeen Proving Ground, which is out there on the East Coast, did a lot of high temperature, high movement testing. And ultimately, they liked what they saw and we did deploy. 2013, 2014, we expanded our product line kind of more into the residential um, emergency response market. We introduced our Phi battery, which has still been one of our best selling batteries. And we're going to talk about that here in a couple slides. 2015, 2016, we relaunched as Simplify Power and we uh, introduced our access unit, which is this cabinet here. You see there's uh, batteries here on the bottom and a couple industry leading inverters on the top like a Solark, like a Schneider, and like our new inverter that I'm also going to be talking about. 2017, 2020, we've been ramping up manufacturing. Uh, we expanded our, 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 uh, our factory line down in Oxnard, California. I'm really proud to say that we actually um, manufacture and assemble these battery packs in the United States. We've also had an uh, R&D facility that we've opened up in Oxnard to make sure we're staying ahead of everybody on um, the technology as it moves forward. We introduced our Amplify battery, which is we're also gonna talk about. It's a lot like our Phi battery, but it has closed loop communication capabilities. One um, thing that I'm really excited to add to this, this slide deck is this slide here. This is talking about how we've recently become acquired by Briggs & Stratton Energy Solutions. And we're now partnering with this company and with us to leverage their size, their resources with our technology and our reputation in the industry to come out with a new fully vertically integrated energy storage system. So we got our own inverter, we got our own app, and we've taken some of our existing battery technologies and repackaged uh, it into an outdoor rated battery. Same battery management system, same cell pack, same form factors that we've always been had a history of now in this vertically integrated system. That's nice because vertically integrated means one tech support call. It means one warranty claim. It means one operating manual. It, it means one app. So you're not dealing with all these different cobbled together pieces of systems to make it work. That being said, um, we do still plan on offering our uh, Phi and Amplify batteries that make great drop-in lead acid battery replacements for systems. And they also pair perfectly with a lot of other competing in, uh, inverters on the market. So we were founded on being safe. We founded on the LFP chemistry. Uh, you don't have to take my word for it. Why? Because we've gone to the UL and we've gone to the UL and had listings. Uh, UL 1642 is on the cell level, the individual cells inside of a battery. 1973 on the battery module level, right? So the cells that are in a pack comprised of a battery module, we have that UL listing. UL 9540 is on a system level. So we have several 
uh, cabinets that house batteries and inverters that have that UL9540. And these are uh, becoming more common um, that jurisdictions, your inspectors are going to be asking for these UL listings as the industry kind of, uh, the, the permitting departments catch up with what us in the industry are doing. 9540A isn't a listing. It's actually a test protocol. And that was pretty interesting. What they did is they took um, one of our batteries and put it inside a larger uh, battery cabinet. And inside one of the batteries, they wrapped one of our cells with a heating blanket or heating wrap and forced that cell into thermal runaway. And then they watched what happened, right? The cell went into thermal runaway, but it didn't really propagate to any of the surrounding cells. Those surrounding cells didn't catch fire themselves and spread to other battery modules. Battery module didn't spread to other modules inside the cabinet, and it didn't ex it go outside the cabinet. So it's uh, important to understand these. We are one of the few companies that actually uh, publishes our 9540A test results. You could go to our website right now and download that test result and take a look at it for yourself. A lot of other companies will uh, hide that because they don't want to show actually what did happen. And a lot of those other companies are uh, cobalt based. Again, I mentioned you're going to need these as we move forward with these uh, AHJs and these inspectors uh, becoming more aware of what these UL listings are. Maybe you're off grid. Maybe you're never going to have an inspector come out there to your the house. You probably still want to look for a UL listing because of insurance purposes. Uh, if there's an event uh, and the insurance adjuster is out there, they're probably going to be looking for that. Uh, sometimes when you sell an off grid property, they're going to be looking for these UL listings. As I mentioned uh, earlier, we were founded on being safe. That's that's what we've always focused on. Um, we use non-toxic, non-hazardous, cobalt-free chemistry with no risk of that thermal runaway. We have those UL certificates that I talked about just a slide ago, but we also ho hold a Department of Transportation certificates, right? DOT, a 3480 allows us to air, um, I'm sorry, allows us to ship with LTL, right, uh, freight trucks. And 38.3 is what allows us to air freight them or air ship them. SGIP, for those of you in California, uh, the self-generation incentive program, there's a lot of money uh, for these systems to go in, especially if somebody's on a well pump or um, a medical device. They might get the whole system paid for. I, I've, I've helped customers do this before. So we are approved. Uh, being a cobalt-free chemistry, we're able to avoid some of the... Um, bad things that happen in that supply chain, You're usually using um, child labor to mine cobalt. We're proven. Again, we're one of the few companies that's been making batteries longer than what their warranty life is for, right? So we have a 10-year warranty. And so we have batteries in the field that are outliving their warranties. Uh, if you have buy a battery from a company that's two years old, that's offering a 10-year warranty, well, they they, you know, how can you do that if you haven't really proven that? So with that uh, experience and growth, we've deployed to over 40 countries. Uh, this number, that 100 megawatt hours installed is, is a little low. It's probably more like 150 megawatt hours installed worldwide. Talked about how we worked with the Army and the Marine Corps. Another thing that I'm really proud to talk about, and I don't want to just gloss over this, is that Simplified Power Briggs & Stratton has a, a business model that can demonstrate social in social impact and profitability can coexist, right? It's the triple bottom line, uh, people, planet, and profits. So we have uh, have an idea program where it, we give back 1% gross to projects around the world that uh, help disadvantaged communities, help uh, projects that are doing good. And if you have an idea for one of those, uh, or you want to work with us and partner on something like that, take a look at our website and we have a, a form that you can fill out and submit your idea. We're able to airship them. We assemble in the United States. We've always wanted to focus on being simple, right? It's in Simplify's name. Um, we want to make sure that you can take one of our batteries and drop it into a system that maybe is already existing. And with just a little bit of reprogramming of that charge controller and that inverter, make that battery work. Uh, we want to be able to store that energy for that critical power, maximize that resilience and energy security, help people save on time of use, peak shaving, um, and demand charges. Uh, this one, I want to 
really quickly focus down here. This is something that we're actually offering a promotion on right now is our Little Jenny and Big Jenny. These are uh, kind of like Pelican case systems where internally here there's a small battery, one of our small batteries, a small inverter, a small charge controller that allows you to kind of um, uh, go off grid without having a full system. And we're running a promotion now because of some of what's happening in uh, Florida, and but the, it's a countrywide promotion, Energize America. So take a look at um, your LinkedIn accounts. Uh, we're, we're pushing that out right now. So how any energy storage system can help customers reduce their power bills, any energy storage system, not just ours, can help prevent uh, people from their power going out from failing infrastructure. And then any energy storage system is going to help uh, move our world to this carbon-free uh, future. Utility prices here in California are going up uh, at least 15% in the last 10 years. I've seen that going up even more as natural gas prices have continued to rise. Uh, Europe, um, that number is probably pretty old um, considering what's happening with their energy concerns. Um, if anybody's ever had to run a diesel generator, you know that jet, uh, diesel prices have gone up a lot. Um, utilities are doing interesting things to raise our price, right? They're implementing time of use rates where during certain times of the day, electricity is more expensive. Well, we can tell the energy storage system to discharge itself during those periods and not use power and then buy from the grid when it's cheap. Surge pricing is a little more common with commercial units, but again, we can tell the system to shave those surge price peaks off and not um, avoid surge pricing. So we can save money using energy storage. Obviously the utility grid um, isn't what it's been up, isn't keeping up with what it needs to be. I know here in um, Northern California, Pacific Gas and Electric is desperately trying to bury electric lines because they've had to shut down a lot of their lines uh, when high wind events come along. Um, so it's it's important that we understand that the grid isn't isn't really being funded the way it should. Uh, we're starting to put a lot more demands on the grid with our electric vehicles, with our heat pumps, with our all electric homes. So having a distributed assets, having energy uh, at the home gives you that resilience. Uh, you know the environment matters. Um, when you when I've sold solar systems, usually you know. Helping people save money is at the top of their mind. Helping people keep their power on is at the top of their mind. But the environment isn't necessarily that far behind. And using um, distributed assets, using storage to help store intermittent power generation sources is what's going to help us move to this uh, clean energy goals that we're setting for us. So let's get into what we came here all for is, is battery chemistry. As I mentioned before, we use LFP battery chemistry, which is um, a safer chemistry, right? Cobalt-based chemistries have a time and a place, right? Uh, Cobalt-based chemistries are more <clears throat> energy dense. They're lighter weight. They're more compact. That's why they're used in our phones. That's why they're used in our laptops. That's why they're used in our cars. But when we're talking about energy storage, <clears throat> excuse me, for our homes, we don't care about lightweight. We don't care about energy density. Why? Because it's stationary. What we care about is safety, that we're going to get, you know, 10 plus years of cycling this battery without any risk of thermal runaway, no toxic elements. They're, they're not necessarily landfill safe, our batteries, but they're a lot easier to recycle than a cobalt-based chemistry, right? There's a big push in the industry to Recycle batteries. Uh, recycling solar modules is is a uh, big thing. I was just recently down in um, uh, RE Plus at, in Anaheim at the Solar Expo. If anybody else was there, um, go ahead and raise your hand. Let us see who who maybe was in there or put it in the chat if you were able to make it to the show. But uh, there were a few booths. Great, I see a couple people raising hands. Um, there were a few people that the whole business is predicated on the recycling or reuse of solar modules. So it, it's catching up. Uh, we can avoid abusive mining practices. 
We don't need ventilation systems with our batteries, right? Because they're sealed batteries. And we don't need an active cooling system to cool the batteries. They, they can passively cooling the system. We don't need safety monitoring systems. Uh, and we're able to work in some extreme environment, temperature environments. And we'll talk about that here in another slide. Talked about chemistry, LFP, but chemistry isn't everything. It's also form factor. So if you were to open up our batteries and take a look inside, you see that we have cylindrical uh, cell, cylindrical form factor. And what this means is that they are a little bit more stable than some of the other form factors, such as a pouch or prismatic. So a cylindrical form factor is, is encased in a metal case. The negative and positive side of the battery are opposite ends. So if anything were to actually happen, it, it's more contained in that metal case. Whereas a pouch cell is more prone to puncture, uh, it can swell and deform. I don't know, I've seen examples of laptop batteries or even cell phones that are puffed up. Prismatic cells, there's nothing wrong with that. They just tend to be a little bulky for our, uh, our application. Jumping in, what is thermal runaway? Um, essentially, it's when something, uh, an, uh, um, an element becomes so hot that a chemical reaction begins to generate more heat and then full, further accelerates that action. And what this does is it usually creates off-gassing, a fire, or even an explosion. What causes it? Usually a short circuit, right? So if you puncture a pouch cell, you're puncturing between some of the, um, the layers, which causes a short circuit. Um, other, also external um, heat sources can cause the, the fire to go into an uncontrolled thermal runaway where it spreads from cell to cell. That's an example of a cell phone there, um, the Galaxy Note 7, which was banned on uh, flights. LFP can still go into thermal runaway. The point being here is that the temperature at which you need to get LFP to go into thermal runaway is higher than what it would be for NMC chemistries. And when LFP does go into thermal runaway, the temperature at which it uh, reaches that thermal runaway is lower. It's also important to note that there's, and I'm not the chemistry expert, I have one of my coworkers, uh, Nathan Heston on this call here, and he can chime in a little bit later on, on the exact chemistry of why uh, LFP releases less gas than MSC, but for me, it, it does. It's, it's simply not gonna outgas as much. Here's a, a quick chart. On the left-hand side, we have um, the normalized heating rate in degrees Celsius from the amp hours of the battery. And then on the lower axis, we have the temperature in centigrade. What you see here is as these different battery chemistries uh, go into thermal runaway, uh, nickel, um, uh, cobalt here, for example, NMC, you can see that these graphs are reaching incredible rates of uh, temperature in centigrade. And what we had to do is actually zoom in and uh, blow up the graph just to see exactly how much less the uh, NMC or the LFP battery, sorry, produces heat as it does go into a thermal runaway event. This is somebody uh, who built this battery actually, and it's showing a, a cooling system, a liquid cooling system, which is required for some of these cobalt-based ba batteries to keep them in with that uh, operating temperature. That's another mode of failure. It's just something else to break. If um, it does, then the battery itself breaks. So by not having these uh, external cooling systems or active cooling systems, it's just another mode of failure that we're able to remove. So we don't need ventilation, cooling, or thermal monitoring. Uh, we warranty our battery 100% depth of discharge unlimited cycles for 10 years. A lot of other companies will make it a little more complicated. They might say at a certain depth of discharge over a certain number of years or over a certain number of cycles. They might even say a certain number of megawatt hour throughput. We wanted to keep it simple. Although we do warranty to 100% depth of discharge, I'd really like to see everyone design their system for 
an 80% depth of discharge. That's going to give your customer the most life of the battery after that warranty period is up. Even if you do run them down to 100%, we're still, still guaranteeing 80% uh, end of life capacity, right? So the battery is still going to retain 80% of its usable capacity at the end of that warranty period. Any lithium ion battery is not going to want to be charged below freezing. It's not just us, you know, our batteries, but it's a common problem. So if you're charging it below freezing, we're going to want to think about some of um, uh, temperature mitigation processes. And we have other trainings where we spend the entire hour just talking about how to think about this, right? Do we want to use uh, external heating pads, insulated battery cabinets, perhaps uh, understanding better the temperature gradients between inside and outside of battery? So if any of that is interesting to you, uh, please check out our YouTube channel on YouTube or on our website where we posted a lot of these other trainings or check out the training calendar. I believe we do have uh, extreme environment uh, training coming up. Back to the slide. Um, if you're discharging the battery or just storing the battery, you can have that wider window, right? Down to negative uh, four Fahrenheit, up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. But if we're charging it, we want to be careful not to charge it below freezing. So we don't need that need for coolant, HVAC, or ventilation. All of our batteries have a battery management system built in. It's mainly there for cell balancing, but it does offer overcurrent protection, short circuit protection, charge and discharge protection. So think of the battery management system as kind of the last line of defense. It, battery management system doing these protections isn't an excuse for a, a poorly programmed system or poorly sized system. So if you're seeing that battery management system go into one of these fall, uh, disconnect modes because you're hammering on it with too many amps or you're discharging it too much, we really want to think about what, what we need to change in the programming or the, the sizing in your system so that it's not doing that. Uh, our batteries can discharge at a C rate of C over two, right? So a C rate is a measure uh, of a rate at which a battery is charged or discharged relative to its maximum capacity. For example, we have a, a 548 volt at 75 amp hours you could charge or discharge that battery completely in two hours at 37.5 amps continuous. A lot of other lead acid batteries, you know, they're at uh, C over 20, C over 10. And if you're really hammering on a lead acid battery, you might see like a C over five rate. As you uh, stack batteries, right, that, that rate is holds the same, but as you add module, battery modules to the system, that 37.5 amps uh, doubles every time you add one battery. What we've always been really uh, proud of is our ability to scale up systems. We think of our uh, batteries, our inverters, as a building block to scale up to what you need. Rather than selling large uh, blocks, we're selling you incremental blocks to, to build up. So we're giving you simple parallel wiring. You never want to run our batteries in series. Uh, and it scales up in both energy and power. Uh, there are uh, communication lines on some of our more advanced battery management systems. It's that scalability, right? Expandability. What do I mean by that? Is the ability to come back to an existing system and expand to that battery bank. Usually people say, Dan, how long can I expand a battery bank? Um, the, the safe answer is maybe about two, two to three years after you've installed that initial system. Any more than that, you're going to start to see some imbalances in the system. But going to a homeowner, and, and maybe the homeowner doesn't have enough money to get this, the biggest system that they want. Maybe they want to just get, get in the door. Well, you could tell them, look, that's no problem. Let's, let's start off with what you got. We can always come back and expand to your system later. Maybe the homeowner did have the money, but now there's uh, life changes. Maybe they started working from home. Maybe they had a kid. Maybe grandma moved in. So we can expand that battery bank. That's something that's not very common in some of our competitors. Uh, this is what it looks like, right? This is a, a, something we scaled up on the left-hand side. This is 80 of our batteries. 
I believe this is in an airport hangar in Hawaii. What I love about the picture is these these bus bars, these custom made copper bus bars. And we're going to talk about wiring here in a little bit, but um, absolutely, you can design your own bus bars. Um, this is 80 batteries. On the right here, this picture is showing what it looks like to expand a system, right? This person had eight batteries. We came back around and added eight more batteries uh, to double the system size. We still use that same SMA inverter there. We're still using that same combiner there. Um, really quickly, we're able to just add in the batteries. One thing I don't like about this picture is that we're showing these batteries upside down. Um, I don't want to see that. I want to see always all the terminal blocks facing up or on their side, like you see here in this picture, never upside down. Uh, I already mentioned this, uh, lithium ion batteries in, in any sealed battery really isn't going to vent gas over time. It's not going to uh, need you to do a truck roll to water the battery. You always get the homeowners that say, oh, don't worry, I will water the batteries. I will check the, the uh, electrolyte level. And it, inevitably, you get a call saying the system's down. You come out there and you realize they didn't water the batteries, and now you're replacing the system. So not having to worry about maintenance or that hydrogen gas venting. Unlike lead-acid batteries, uh, LFP batteries don't have a, a high self-discharge rate. You know, think about 1% per month. It's not like your old pickup truck where if you don't drive it every week uh, and you come out there, the battery's dead. Uh, so you get that thing in a pretty good high state of charge. It's going to be there for a while, ready to go when you need it. Uh, there's a bunch of L16s, right? Those look like six volt L16 Trojans. And you can see all of the, um, that, the paste here um, to prevent the oxidation. You got temperature sensor wires everywhere. Uh, what a mess. We were able to come out to the system. And, and these are actually some of our older modules, but I, I just love this photo. We were able to come out to this site. The picture on the right showing the batteries that we installed has just as much energy storage capacity, right, in kilowatt hours as the picture on the left. But it also has just as much power throughput or the ability to discharge the batteries at a fast rate as that picture on the left. So it's a great success. If all you do is go out and, and replace lead acid batteries with our batteries, you would be successful. It, there's no reason to change out some of that existing charge controllers or inverters. You got to have to reprogram them. And fortunately, we do have on our website some integration guides that help walk you through how to change the settings in that outback, in that magna sign in the order in which those pieces of equipment are asking for those set points. So I, I think I have a slide coming up that shows you where to find some of those resources on our integration guides. They're, they're on our website. I wanna quickly run through the products um, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, some design and installation. This has been our best seller for a long time. This is our five 3.8 kilowatt hour. It's either 24 or 48 volt battery. It does not have communication capabilities, unlike the Amplify battery. That doesn't mean that this is any less of a good battery, right? You don't really need communication capability batteries if you're using a system that doesn't have the, the communication capabilities. You're just paying for something you don't need. So if you're coming out to a site uh, that has some midnight solars with some outbacks, with whatever the case may be, Go ahead and purchase one of these uh, standard five batteries. It's going to work great for you. Uh, it has that. It does still have an integrated battery management system in it that is going to uh, disconnect itself if it doesn't see a system that it's like. Like if you discharge it too uh, low or charge it too high or um, either in current or in voltage. And it does have a built-in uh, circuit breaker, which all of our batteries have, and that's a feature that I really like, right? So why does that matter? Well, if you're going to install the battery, turn the breaker off. You can do all of your connections without risking um, shorting, you know, if you got your 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 wrench and you're risking uh, shorting the battery out and get a big pop, uh, you don't have that risk if you're, the battery's off. It, during troubleshooting, it allows you to, um, turn off other batteries in the system and isolate certain batteries so you can do testing. 
So the integrated circuit breaker is great, not only for over current protection, but for installation and uh, testing. We do make a smaller uh, Phi 1.4 kilowatt hour battery, and this notably comes in 12 volts uh, and 24 volts. This is great for mobile applications. So if anybody has, uh, I don't know if some people were at the show, there was a, um, everybody's getting these sprinter vans or these uh, these Ford Transit vans and nobody buys standard RVs. Everyone's doing these van conversions. And I love seeing um, my Facebook groups where you can see uh, people, how they think about these systems. These make a great um, solution for people doing these mobile applications. Right, it has a, a integrated battery management system and breaker. It's in this AB. This is actually an ABS case here, so it's great for uh, marine applications. So you're not going to get corrosion. It's lightweight, allows you to smaller, kind of allows you to fit it into smaller places. Uh, this is one of our two energy storage systems. This is our Express Energy Storage System. It's in this NEMA 3R rated enclosure. This is great for apartments, right? Maybe you have a situation where you cannot hardwire something. You can roll this in. It has a DC inlet to, to charge up the batteries, right? It just runs right through this little charge controller, charges up the batteries. You don't need solar, right? Because here's this MagnaSign charger inverter. So you can have AC inlet. So you can plug this into the wall and it's just simply keeping these batteries charged. If grid goes down, you have AC outlets that allow you to charge up your lights, your computer, your cell phone, whatever the case may be. I like it for uh, service changes. Say we're going out to a homeowner's house and we're doing a service upgrade. Maybe we're doing 100 to 200 amp service and you got a retired couple inside and they still want to maybe watch TV or make lunch. Well, roll this out to the job site, run a little extension cord in for them, and you got a couple extra outlets for the workers to charge up their uh, tools and, and or maybe run a saw if they need to. It's the Express ESS. That's a portable one. This ESS or Access Energy Storage System is permanently mounted. So it comes in the same NEMA 3R cabinet. We have a couple industry leading inverters in there. That's the Solar uh, 12K, it looks like there. Uh, but we can also do uh, a Schneider XW Pro and our new inverter as well, which is coming out. We have the 9540A listings on this uh, cabinet. So you know you're going to be able to pass that inspection. This is great, especially when it has the Solarc or a new inverter, because it allows you to come out to a site and say the grid tight inverter is already on the side of the house. Just plop this thing down, pour a little concrete pad, uh, mount this enclosure next to the grid tight inverter, and you can easily AC couple in that existing solar. Um, if you got a, a DC coupled system, that that that's totally fine too. There's a lot of push from a lot of AHJs that they don't want to see stuff in garages anymore. And if they do, if you do put something in garages, right, what are they making you do? They're making you put in this extra drywall, this X rock, or, or I'm not sure the, the familiar term, or they're making you put in heat detectors, not smoke detectors, heat detectors. Maybe they're making you put in a parking bollards uh, so nobody crashes their car into one of these. So there's a lot of um, complications as you get into garages. And uh, so having this outdoor rated unit is, is a really great feature. Um, we do have other cabinets that simply don't have any inverters in it. So you already have a, a, a Solark outside or one of our new ESSs. We can take one of those same cabinets that I mentioned earlier and just pack them full of batteries. That's called Boss uh, 12 and a Boss 6. I'm not the expert in high voltage, but it's something we do. We have a whole team of uh, uh, CNI people where their only job is to work with large scale backup systems, so microgrids. So if you have a system or a project that you're thinking about doing um, one of these high voltage systems, email me. I will gladly connect you up with that team. Uh, it's it's a containerized solution, right? You basically you pour a concrete pad. We will drop a 40 foot container on your project site that's one megawatt hour. It has built in uh, HVAC systems, you know, all the built in stack controllers that control the batteries. Again, I'm not the expert. Let me know if this is something that's interesting to you. 
uh, CAN bus, MOD bus, and all the communication protocols to make it work. Here's the Amplify battery. This is the one I was talking about earlier. You know it's the Amplify because it has these uh, communication ports up here on the top. Uh, there's no external communication uh, card that you need to install. Uh, we can do a 100 amp discharge max at 10 minutes. That's great for starting well pumps, for starting uh, motors, maybe a dryer. It actually does have a built-in 10K thermistor inside this battery that's communicating with the battery management system, which in turn communicates with the inverter charger. It's telling the piece of equipment, hey, uh, we're getting pretty close to freezing. Let's go ahead and slow down my charge rate or discharge rate. And at some point when it reaches below freezing, it will actually tell the piece of equipment, the inverter charger, charge controller to stop. So having that temperature protection built in is a nice feature so you don't destroy your batteries. Um, why are communications important, right? Because some pieces of equipment, when you're trying to determine the state of charge of a lithium ion battery based solely on voltage, is it the most accurate? When we use communication, uh, based protocol batteries, we're able to tell the piece of equipment what its state of charge is. It's also telling the inverter what the maximum charge rate or discharge rate is. So it's um, compatible currently with SMA, Solark, and our new inverter. That's our new inverter right here, right? Um, with the partnership with Briggs & Stratton, We've released our new energy storage system. This is kind of a teaser slide. I'm gonna go really quickly um, into one other topic and then we'll circle back to this. But these are the batteries, 4.98 kilowatt hour batteries, same chemistry, same form factor, same battery management system we've been making forever, now housed in this outdoor weatherproof enclosure. The inverter, is also outdoor rated IP65, um, and that's right there on the top. Um, one thing when it comes to selling lithium ion batteries, I, I would argue of any manufacturer when up against some lead acid batteries is that there's always a higher upfront cost or a higher upfront price to these batteries. And what it's, it's our job as a um, energy, um, advisor, not a salesperson, right? Uh, an energy consultant, is for us to help customers see past the upfront price and see where the cost of the system lies at as the life of the system, right? So just don't look at the upfront price. How many years of service are you going to get out of this system? How many years are going to go by before you have to replace that battery pack? So here's a little math. I love using math when we're sitting down at the kitchen table with some homeowners because it allows us to look past uh, that sales kind of role and look at more of an energy consultant role. You don't have to do the math because there is like an energy calculator down here and everybody's gonna get a copy of this slide deck so you can um, take a look at this later. But essentially you take the price of a battery over its capacity by the cycle life it's warranted for by the efficiency, by its planned depth of discharge. And you, and you do all that math and it shows you what, how much does it cost for every kilowatt hour I put into the battery and take out of the battery. And that alone is gonna probably, is oh, I know it's gonna be better than a lot of lead acid batteries and our batteries are probably gonna be better than some of the other lithium ion uh, competition out there. That's without even including some of the ancillary costs like if I got a big lead acid battery, you know, that's going to cost a lot more for me to ship it to you. Maybe I have to rent some special equipment to install it. Maybe I'm going to throw my back out when I'm installing it and I'm, uh, or one of my installers is and they're going to miss a couple days. What's that going to cost you? What's it going to cost you for an additional cooling system? What's it going to cost you for ventilation or other big, huge battery box I have to build for those lead acid batteries? So look beyond just costs. Uh, we have this tool, utilize it when you're making the sale to help you uh, look at the, the, the cost of the system over its life so rather than just the upfront price. What do we call it? We call it the levelized cost of energy. Uh, really quickly, we're going to do sizing. 
uh, some installation techniques, and then we'll we'll kind of wrap it up with some um, training, future training. We're, we're a little ahead of time. I hope to uh, end it within the hour with questions. So thanks for sticking with us. As I mentioned before, uh, we cycle our batteries to an 80% recommended. You can cycle it down to 100, but if you cycle it down to an 80% depth of discharge, we expect you to get about 10,000 cycles out of the battery. And if you're cycling it daily, so 10,000 divided by 365, that's about 27 years of life you could expect to get out of the battery. If you are hammering on it, right, and discharging it down to 100%, you're going to get about 3,500 cycles. But that may actually be appropriate for some situations, right? If we have an off-grid home, or maybe we're doing a lot of um, time of use arbitrage, let's let's do 80% depth of discharge because we know we're cycling it daily. We know we're hammering on it. But imagine we have a house that's only backup, like the battery is basically sitting there fully charged most of the time, not cycling. Let's size the system for a 90 or 100% depth of discharge because we know we're not really using it a lot. There's no reason that we're going to want to sell a couple extra batteries to somebody for that, that shallow cycle life. Let's, let's sell them a, small, a slightly smaller system with the expectation that they're going to do a 90 or 100% depth of discharge because there's no real reason to if they're not really cycling it a lot. But if it's off-grid, please let's do an 80% uh, depth of discharge sizing. So that was sizing related to how much energy and kilowatt hour capacity we need for uh, a storage system. But we also have to think about what's gonna be the maximum demand that the batteries might see to power loads, right? So in power in watts or kilowatts. Here, this is a great, this is an example I always, my go-to example. Here's our radian. Uh, 8,000 watt inverter. If for whatever reason, this inverter needs to output all 8,000 watts, it's going to start drawing on these batteries. And what I want to see is that we have enough batteries in the battery bank to where we're not going to exceed that continuous charge or discharge rate of our batteries, the C over two. Let's go back to that 3.8 kilowatt hour battery. At C over two, its maximum discharge rate is 1.9 kilowatts, so a little under two. So we're going to want at least five batteries in this on this radian 8,000 watt. So in case it ever does call for all of its power, you're not going to exceed that maximum discharge rate. You might say, oh, Dan, don't worry about it. Uh, I don't have th that many loads. There's not that many loads in this breaker. Well, what if somebody comes back along and adds loads. That could be a problem. I will let you get away with it. Imagine if you have Amplify batteries, and this was a Solark, and the Solark is trying to pull all of its power uh, more than what the batteries can handle. Well, the Amplify batteries and the new battery, the Simplify battery, will tell that Solark, will tell the SMA, don't exceed this much because I can't handle that. So if you're using the standard five batteries, uh, always have double the batteries to what the inverter rating is with Amplify and a compa communication compatible inverter. I'll let you get away with it. You can see in this example, although they only needed five batteries, it looks like they needed more batteries to maintain the energy storage capacity to meet the home's loads. Here's some tools. I'm not going to jump into them today. Uh, this first tool is simply there to help you estimate your battery bank size. So you put in what's my consumption daily, how many days of autonomy I want to do, what do I plan to discharge the batteries down to, it'll spit out how many batteries you need. This second calculator is a little more advanced. This one will take into account what you, what pieces of equipment you already have so that you're not exceeding those charge or discharge rates. It gets a little deeper into some of the um, the, the uh, days of autonomy as well. And then this last calculator is, is a great one. If you've got somebody that has lead acid batteries, put in what you got. What are they? L16 Trojans, six volt. You got eight of them. You discharge them down to 50% state of charge. This calculator here will tell you how many 
uh, buy or amplify batteries you need to replace that system, those existing lead acids while maintaining the energy capacity, right, in kilowatt hours and uh, meet the the power or the, the watts that you need to, to flow to a piece of equipment. We're going to do installation, uh, and then we're going to finish up with some training. Uh, we spent a lot of time working on our integration guides. I mentioned this earlier. Here's the link to product documentation. You're going to find the manuals, the spec sheets. If you don't, you know, not everybody reads the manual. If, if at anything, read the integration guide. It's going to help you understand how to program that, uh, <clears throat> that Outback, that whatever piece of equipment you got to treat our batteries the way they want to be treated, right? We're going to adjust our low voltage battery cutout. We're going to adjust our absorb voltage. We're going to disable our equalization stages. We're going to get in there and change everything. And these integration guides are set up in such a way that they're, uh, the flow of them are in the order in which you'll see the menu options appear on that Mate 3 or the um, whatever interface you're using to, to program. So simplify power product documentation. Please read the manual also. I mentioned this earlier. Um, I don't wanna see the batteries upside down, uh, but you can definitely do them on their, their side um, or vertical, like you see here in the picture, you can see that we got these wall brackets uh, that are really nice. You don't have to use them. I've seen a lot of custom uh, cabinets built. You you could theoretically put them right up against each other. In this example, they're spread a little bit far apart. Um, you might get a little bit extra heat buildup. Uh, we did. Some, you remember those Boss Six and Boss Twelve cabinets that I showed you earlier? That's another great uh, solution if you don't want to do a, a wall hanging bracket. When it comes time to wiring our batteries, um, in the um, good old days, the lead acid batteries, right, you usually run a few batteries in series and then parallel up some and then you create your, your bank. We never want to run our batteries in series, only parallel. And when you do parallel wiring, I want to see conductors of the same gauge and the same length going to a common bus bar, terminal block, or some other common connection point. That way, we're going to treat each battery just as hard as the next, and we're not going to get any impedance in the lines. That being said, um, we don't want a daisy chain, right? Daisy chain would be positive, 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 then up to the piece of equipment, negative, 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 then up to the piece of equipment. We don't want to see those on the FI or the Amplify. Just to make things more confusing, we are now allowing that on the new ESS system um, up to four batteries. And I'll show you here a picture in a second. This is an example. If you're using the FI, the uh, Amplify, or you're using our new battery with more than four batteries, you are still going to need to use some sort of combiner to, to bring all of those battery cables to a common connection point and then from that common connection point using a much thicker conductor to go to the piece of equipment that's a, a midnight solar a thousand amp combiner there uh victron makes some uh, blue sea systems make some uh maybe if somebody wants to put into a chat what their favorite combiner is that'd be fun to see but um keep in mind we want to have each battery working just as hard as the next and by using combiners, that's how we accomplish that. Here's a quick example of what it looks like um, for a DC coupled system, right? Here's some solar modules. These look like Tygo TS4F, probably fire. They may be O's, I don't know. Uh, here's our Tygo transmitter. The solar arc is actually feeding a 12 volt to the transmitter, which is then sending the keep alive signal up the wires. Uh, the SOLARC has that rapid shutdown button if you ever need it uh, to meet uh, code. Here's a critical load subpanel. Here's grid, right, feeding into non-backed up loads, which is then feeding into the SOLARC. Here's our combiner and two BOSS 12 cabinets. If you only had one BOSS 12 cabinets, you wouldn't need this combiner because it's hard, a little hard to see, but there actually are a couple of um, bus bars, one negative, one positive. I think they're actually more, they'd be more appropriate to call them terminal blocks inside here. I guess it's 
terms interchangeable. Uh, please, if you are out there and you are getting ready to do the install, please go to the van, go to your truck and get your torque wrench. Don't let one of your guys get an impact driver and go to town on one of the, the battery lugs and snap it off. Uh, we're looking for 160 inch pounds, which is probably less than you think it is. Um, if you over torque and break off one of those lugs, you know, it's, it's awful because you're, it's usually right when you're about to turn the system on, we're going to have to send the battery back. We're going to have to fix it for you, replace it. So you're going to be kind of dead in the water if it's too small of a system. Uh, ideally, it would be an insulated torque wrench. Um, but if you got it, remember, you can turn the battery breaker off as you're doing this connection. So even if it's non-insulated, you're still not going to get a big pop in your face. Uh, we're going to end up really quickly with the energy storage system. Uh, there's our new inverter six kilowatt inverter. It still has a screen on it, so you can program it. We do include an app that allows you to program it remotely. And we here's our battery, the 4.98 kilowatt hour battery. You can scale up to nine of our inverters. There's an eight millisecond transfer time, so you're not even going to see your lights flicker. If you do have some medical devices, please check the, um, the ratings on those just to see if it is less than eight milliseconds. There is still a display. I love that. A lot of people's equipment nowadays doesn't have a display. So homeowners have no idea what's happening. Um, to have a display is, is nice. Um, it's, it's outdoor rated. It has a 10 year warranty on the inverter. Here's the battery, 10,000 cycles at an 80% depth of discharge, just the same as our other batteries. Uh, we can scale up to 72 batteries. Uh, it's going to be unlikely that anyone needs over 350 kilowatt hours, but you can do it. Um, we have that same LFP chemistry, same form factor. It's outdoor rated. The app, I don't want to skip over this too quickly because there's a lot of work. Actually, I was surprised how much work and energy and money and time goes into creating an app. And homeowners want this now. Homeowners don't want to go out and check their old trimetrics monitor and see what the, the voltage is of their battery uh, they want an app. They want to see it on their phone, on their tablet, whatever the case may be. Uh, and, and we offer that. Uh, I think uh, installers want an app now too to help them do fleet management, to help them monitor systems remotely, to help them re remotely reconfigure systems. The last thing I, I hate to do is get a system all programmed and then realize I didn't do it right and then have to drive back out to the site, especially if it's some off out of the middle of nowhere off-grid site. So be able to remotely reconfigure as long as the site has internet and they haven't changed their password or anything, we can do that. And that's why I always like to see the uh, these um, monitoring systems hardwired with uh, Wi-Fi and not just simply, I mean, hardwired with ethernet, not simply using Wi-Fi. It does actually, also the device will transmit Bluetooth to your phone uh, initially to help you get everything set up. Lastly, uh, I want to plug our um, Elite IQ installer program. If anybody on this call is currently installing our batteries, uh, please reach out to me. My email is about to pop up in a few slides for anybody that's looking for their NAB sub credits. Uh, anybody that's looking to uh, join the IQ program, email that one as well. I'll put you on our maps on our website so that if somebody comes to Simplify Power's website looking for an installer, we'll, we'll drive the business to you. I'll send you some t-shirts. Uh, we have a photo contest, $25 photo contest. Uh, we also have a $25 cash back per battery that we can start offering you. If you are gonna send in photos, please take, I love to see the equipment, but I love more to see pictures of the installers doing their thing, the pictures of the homeowner standing in front of their system, maybe a picture of the cat or the dog, you know, standing in front of something if you, if you happen to get that, because people, uh, pictures of people tell stories so much better than just a couple batteries hanging on a wall. I'll take that too if you got it. That's the link to the IQ installer. Um, if you have it, there's my email. Training at simplifypower.com. Email me if you're looking for the NAB sub credits. Again, be sure to include your full first name and last name. Spell it out because I need to get your, your certificate correct. Otherwise, you might get a kickback from NAB sub on it. Um, if you haven't already, go ahead and put in some uh, questions in the Q&A chat, 
and uh, we'll go ahead and open it up to Q and A. Nathan, uh, who's on the line, did you did I miss anything? Did you have anything to add or or thoughts and ideas? Go ahead. Daniel, I think you. Uh, it was a great training. There's some good questions, and I've tried to um, reply to some of them. So I don't really have anything to add other than you said we have a $25 um, photo contest. It's actually $250 prize for our monthly photo contest. So Thank do you. send in your pictures. Uh, we'd like to get those rewards out to you. And and honestly, it's fairly easy to win this picture contest. Not that many people take the time to take pictures of their systems and send them to us. So please do. And if there are good submissions and we have several of them that month and you don't win, we'll roll it over. Yeah, thank you. And, and I would, even if you're not taking pictures to, to win this money, I always uh, encouraged uh, my installers to take pictures of everything, right? Because if you got pictures of the system and something goes wrong, you can you don't have to drive out to the site to figure it out. You got pictures in your uh, your cloud or whatever in your company files that allow you to to take a look at some of the stuff. So having uh, close out photos is always important. And then get send us, if you already got the photo, send us the last photo. Uh, let's jump through some of the questions. Maybe uh, Nathan didn't have a question uh, opportunity to answer. Um, Elliot's asking, if the ESS system is scalable, why wouldn't you just install this for virtually all residential systems? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, Maybe you can expand on that question. So I think uh, what he means is, can yeah. can this work? Can our ESS work for just about anybody's system? And the answer is yes, right? So if if you have a small off-grid installation that that the customer only wants maybe five kilowatts of power, right? This will work for it. But if you have a family that's got a home that are running multiple air conditioners and you need 30, 40 kilowatts of power. Yes, you can just parallel more of the inverters together, five inverters together, and you're up at 30 kilowatts of continuous power, right? And it'll surge, right, to, to one and a half times that at 45, right? So, so yes, that's the idea is that you think of these inverters and batteries as building blocks to hit just yep. about any size that yep. you like. Um, I do want to answer, I answered these questions um, in, in the chat, but a number of people had asked about our cells and whether or not we manufacture those in Oxnard. We do not want to be fully transparent. We do use a supplier that's in Asia, but we've had this agreement with this same supplier for 10 years, and we feel like the cells that we're offering are premium cells that, that we've worked with the, the manufacturer to refine over the years, and so we feel like they're the top of the line. Um, there are there was another question about whether or not we use, um, you know, American made components inside our batteries. Yes, um, our battery housing, uh, for example, terminals, um, these are manufactured in the United States. Uh, we use some components external, right? And, and some that are uh, uh, locally sourced, right? So we have global and locally sourced parts. So yep. trying to be fully transparent with my answers there, we just don't disclose um, the, the manufacturer of our cells. Yeah, um, absolutely. And it's important to note that we do assemble the cell packs in the United States. So I'm really proud to say that. And I've seen the factory line. Um, so by having, you know, we American engineering to, to select the, the best cells we possibly can get and then assemble them here in the States. Right. We have a, a lot of quality controls on our batteries and, you yep. know, having them manufactured in the U.S. means that also if, you know, if you do have problems, it's easy for us to diagnose. We have engineers, we have um, technicians that it will look at any kind of problem. So anyway, I uh, wanted to mention that we had a great question about vanadium batteries, and I honestly can't tell you that much about them, um, but there seemed to be some interest in those. Daniel, I don't know if you know more about vanadium batteries no. than me. No, I think so you know one, of, one of the things that causes inefficiencies in batteries is the, the migration of the ions. And so the migration of ions as they move from the cathode to the anode in the battery um, can, can create heat inside the battery. And so if you have a really heavy element, really heavy ion uh, like vanadium flowing, you've got a lot of kinetic energy with that flow and that can turn into heat. So the one thing I do know about vanadium batteries is the round trip efficiencies are much, much lower than lithium. You know, we're looking at efficiencies in the 90%, right? 94% round trip efficiency, 92% round trip efficiency. Uh, and I think that that's the big holdup for vanadium batteries. They also have a lower voltage. I think it's like one and a half volts per, per cell. But 
Um, again, I don't know that much about them. I just thought we could try to address that question. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I love chemistry lessons. Um, Daniel, there's some other great ones here that I think you're better suited for. Um, somebody was asking about um, the the return on investment, and I think you have some answers to that. So d is there a calculator available where you can see when the payoff period is, was one of the questions. Yeah, so the um, the... Levelized cost of energy is, is going to help you understand that. Really, you have to use some tools like Aurora Solar, Open Solar, right? You're going to put in how much solar you would plan on installing, how much battery you plan on installing, what their consumption is, what their utility rate is. And these, uh, these programs like Aurora, like Open Solar, like PV Watts will do the math for you. So it depends upon how much energy they're consuming. Uh, what rate schedule they're on, right? Because you could be on a time of use rate. You could be on a, a, a low income utility rate. You could be on a, a heating only electric heating rate. So the, really to understand that those math questions, there's programs out there like PV Watts, um, uh, Aurora Solar, Open Solar, which is a free one that you can, that does all the math for you. That gives you the payback time, right? Is it eight year payback for a customer, a nine year payback customer? Uh, Nathan, I also saw a good one is that, uh, a lot of people, and I've noticed this in the industry, is that in the good old lead after days, we always said, oh, it's a 100 amp hour battery. Oh, it's a 200 amp hour battery. But in these new ESS batteries, we always rate the batteries in kilowatt hours. And, and it's really simple math, right? All you do is if it's a 100 amp hour battery at 12 volts, well, that's 1.2 kilowatt hour battery. So it's just interesting that we've kind of changed some of the nomenclature on there. Is there another good question you got from me, Nathan? Well, I think I think to add to that answer, Daniel, um, one of the reasons we do that is that all the lead acid batteries were almost always standardized at 12 volts, right? Occasionally yeah. you would have some 24 volt systems, but really what you want to know is how much energy your battery will hold. And kilowatt hours are, that's that's a unit of energy, right? If you specify just amp hours and you don't know the voltage, you don't actually know how much energy is in the battery. Yeah. Additionally, with a lead acid battery, right, you don't really get 100% depth of discharge. So even if you do specify the amp hours and the voltage, right, you have a certain amount of energy in the battery, but you can't use it without damaging the battery. Yep. It's important to note that LFP batteries, you can discharge them down to 100% depth of discharge. And so it really is more appropriate to specify the amount of energy in the battery in terms of kilowatt hours. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, and usually and, take amp hours and multiply by voltage to get kilowatt hours. Yeah, and there you go. Yeah. And, and as you discharge a lead acid battery quicker, right? A C over five capacity is a lot different than a C over 20 capacity of a lead acid battery. Where we're rating our capacity at C over two discharge. Um, can, there was uh, another question about the uh question so Dan daniel there was a question about our generator the express generator yeah can the express mobile accept solar panels to create a solar generator if you could do that what's the max capacity yeah great question um i would probably have to pull up the spec sheets on it that little charge controller in there it looked like a 20 amp maybe charge controller um, but yeah, email us uh, and I'll email you back the spec sheet on what that charge controller is rated for. Um, you know, 20 amps is still a, a pretty decent solar size, a few, uh, you know, a couple large, large panels. Um, but absolutely, it's it's a great so solution for something that's portable and get some rolling panels or get some folding solar panels and put them out there. So an easy calculation for you there is that our, our batteries charge up at just a little over 50 volts when they're charging. And so if, if you have 20 amps, 20 times 50 is 1,000 watts. So I don't know if Daniel's correct on that being a 20 amp charge controller. <laughs> um, but if he is, then that would be about 1,000 watts uh, coming in. But we'll get to the spec sheet on that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Here's another one. Is it possible to have different discharge charge current from the battery when mounted in parallel some cable length and connected to a bus bar? Nathan, do you want to take that? Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. Is yeah, it so you're going to have the same current. Um, and I'm happy to take it. Um, I didn't see the question. Is it um, is it possible to have different discharge rates out of the two batteries. 
Um, I, I'm not sure I got the question right, but I will say that the batteries have to be uh, wired in parallel, right? And you really want to be discharging batteries um, at even rates, right? You don't want to be discharging one battery faster than others because then the battery you're char discharging most rapidly will, will experience the most amount of wear. Um, but yep. I'm not sure I got that question. Yeah, and that's yeah. Exactly. Email us if email us if if that if you need a little further uh, answer on that. Um, but yeah, we want each battery to work just as hard as the next. Uh, I am going to get some slides out. Everybody who's attended this or even registered for this will get slides. And on uh, on our website is larger pictures, and I can email you some high resolution ones as well. Um, uh, how specifically does your output circuit breaker work? Is it a physical disconnect or a solid state relay? Uh, so there's two inside the batteries. There is a breaker. Uh, there are, um, and the, the battery management system can disconnect itself. A lot of uh, AHJs are asking for uh, um, external disconnects as well. So check with your AHJs uh, on that. Um, uh, somebody's asking about EV conversions. I don't believe we're using our batteries on, in EVs yet. Um, and I think that's about it. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, again, if you need your NABSAP credits, please go ahead and email training at simplifypower.com. Check out our training calendar on the internet, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.